The Lord be with you. Good morning and welcome to worship in Hillsborough Presbyterian Church. If you are visiting, you are especially welcome. Please sign the visitor's book you'll find in the vestibule and also join us for refreshments in the welcome area, which is to my right and to your left. In greeting people here in church today, I also greet those who are following online, either live or later, and also those who will listen to CDs when they're distributed. You're all very welcome. Our call to worship today is from Psalm 95 and familiar words which are rendered several times in this part of the Psalms. These words are something similar. Come let us bow down and worship him. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. He is our God. We are the people he cares for, the flock for which he provides. In looking to the great shepherd of the sheep, God's reign over our lives and his love given in Christ and the Spirit. We now sing a rendering of the 23rd Psalm. It's 527 in the hymn books and the words are on the screens. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. And Lord's Prayer, let us join in prayer. Loving God, Heavenly Shepherd, we trust in you alone. We meet here today as the people of God, as the body of Christ, as the fellowship of the Spirit, glad to know that you have called us to be your very own, the sheep of your pasture the earthly flock at home in your care. As we journey through life, you lead us into the ways of righteousness and guide our paths to still waters and green pastures. And even when we stray from you, you have come to find us and save us, rescued from harm, even in the darkest valley or the deepest pit. Forgive, O Lord, our willfulness, thinking that we know best, when in truth we are wandering away from the straight and the narrow, the good path, only to land in a heap of trouble, often enough of our own making. Return us to your care, 
and safely restored, may we once more share in your abundance, feasting on your pure delights, our cup overflowing with relief and joy and peace. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Boys and girls, if you'd like to come to the front, either from upstairs or from downstairs, wherever you are, uh, I'll speak to you in just a few moments. But first, the announcements. And our first announcement, or maybe a double announcement, is from Francis. And it's with regards to Christian Aid Week, which is coming quite soon. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Alan, for allowing allowing me a little minute to uh, speak to people. But I want to talk to you about Christian Aid, which runs from the 12th to the 18th of uh, May. The 12th of May is actually the morning when we have communion. It runs from that Sunday until the Saturday at the end of the week. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for your contributions that were made last year. Uh, we raised uh, from church collection uh, almost 1,400, £135 online, £1,062 from the delivery only envelope. And when you add that all to give you, together, it gives you about 3600 plus gift aid. So that's a big uh, contribution that you have made. And I do thank you and Christian Aid, I'm sure, put it to very good use. So thank you very much. Now, we're looking forward to Christian Aid Week this oncoming year. So what can you do to help? Well, obviously, the first thing is your, your money, your financial contribution. Very, very important. They have many projects that they're dealing with. This year, they will be focusing on a project in uh, Burundi in East Africa, uh, trying to help, uh, especially the women there, uh, improve their education, help them to get jobs, within their farming, advancing it, making more money, and therefore money to invest in educating their children and caring for their families. So, I mean, the need is great. Christian Aid has various projects throughout the year and also steps in when uh, there are emergencies that occur. So your financial contribution is extremely important, and the Christian Aid Week is their big money collecting week. So please be generous in your uh, contributions that you make. Now, how can you make those contributions? Well, on Sunday the 12th, you will have an envelope in your pew, uh, which you can pick up and then return the following Sunday to the church offering plate or perhaps the Sunday after that with your money within it. And if you are a taxpayer, please, please, will you take the time to fill in the little cover slip with your details? And then you simply tear that off and you pop it into the envelope. Uh, 12.5% sorry, not gift aid, 12.5%, uh, 25%, sorry, is a big amount of money. So please, please remember to fill that in if you're making your contribution using that envelope. You can, use, you can make your contribution online. Uh, the um, Carl, uh, many thanks to him and possibly to Mark, will have um, a giving page. Uh, focused as well money will go into our church and then it will pass on to Christian Aid um, and it you'll find that on the church website if that's how you would like to uh, contribute or you can also contribute using the QR code which you can see on Facebook so those are the online methods if you wish and then also there will be the delivery only envelope uh, which will you will get a uh, a copy through your letterbox, I hope, and uh, you can d- get rid of that. It's exactly the same as the envelope you'll pick up in the pew, but we can't decipher in the village 
that person goes to Hillsborough Presbyterian, don't give them an envelope. So everybody in the village will get the delivery only envelope. And it, for you, it will be a second one. So you can either put it in your, your bin or maybe give it to someone that you know who might not uh, have, uh, doesn't live in Hillsborough and might not have been given an envelope. So those are the ways that you can contribute. And if you wish, you can put your contribution in the delivery only envelope. This is last year's, uh, but on it, there is a little slip that advises people which businesses in the village will accept the envelope. They have a large bucket in which the envelopes can be placed. Usually the buckets are kept in behind the counter because it's too easy perhaps for somebody to lift the bucket and take off with it. So they're usually kept in behind the counter. But this year I have asked some of the, of the businesses would they like to have a tin. It's actually a plastic box, but a, the equivalent of a tin so that just people in buying a newspaper or whatever or buying something can toss a few coins in as they wish. But that's not for the envelopes. That goes into the bucket in it behind the counter. Uh, as I say, it does name those and it will give the QR code on that. So that will be uh, available to uh, people who are contributing online. So your money's the first thing I'm after. So the second thing I'm looking for is uh, your time. Uh, thanks to those who did take time last year and helped us with those delivery only envelopes uh, we covered both uh, Hillsborough and Kilcave a big job, there are a lot of households there so well, I'm grateful to those who helped, I'm assuming that you might be available again this year but I'd like some more people, it's a very effortless job, you simply carry a pile of envelopes you drop them through letter boxes. that's all. You don't involve yourself with money. You don't return to collect them. It's simply really behaving as a postman. And I would really like more people uh, to assist with that. And I shall be at the entrance to the Welcome Mary today waiting for confirmation of uh, people from last year who are taking part and also getting uh, a lot of new people this year to assist us. So that's the uh, second thing I was saying. You want to give your money. I want you to give your uh, time. Uh, and those envelopes, and certainly next week, I would hope maybe you can sign up for your area and the envelopes will be ready uh, to give to you. So please, please volunteer. And then the third thing is the uh, soup, bread and cheese uh, lunch, uh, which is uh, very much part of Christian Aid uh, and we are hosting that here in the, the, our church this year the parish church uh, hosted it last year so we are the host this year. Now for that to work there are some things that are needed you will see mention of this in the notices uh, in the back of your uh, order of service but there are provisions required things such as uh, butter milk, tray bakes uh, breads, <clears throat> soups, and you will see out in the vestibule a list of the things that are needed, and I hope people will sign up to agree to bring that. The Christian Aid lunch is the 16th, the Thursday of Christian Aid week, 16th of May, so it would be appreciated if people would uh, sign up, if they could possibly. And one thing that I, prob I didn't ask Dawn to put on, well, it does say assistance. Uh, that doesn't just helping with... Uh, serving the food or clearing tables or whatever, but also we need some assistance for setting up the, the tables and so on. So a lot needed there for that big event which will be happening on the 16th of May. So your money, your, your time, and then assistance and money associated with the Christian Aid soup uh, and bread lunch. We're asking for a minimum donation of £5 and hopefully some might be more generous. It will be... A, a good lunch, so uh, please come along and support. I suppose that's another thing I should be asking for. If you're if you're working, obviously you can't, but if you're not working, come along to the bread and cheese lunch. And then finally, I suppose something that you can everybody can contribute, uh, and that is uh, contribute by prayer. Prayer is very important for the Christian Aid event. Pray that people will uh, be generous in their donation and in their time and so that and pray that Christian Aid will put the money that is donated in the Christian Aid week towards the projects which uh, they have undertaken. So thank you very much and uh, 
I'll see you perhaps at the welcome area with my clipboard. Okay, sorry, and thank you, Alan. Thank you, Francis. So there's lots there and lots for you to, to help to do. The other announcements, uh, one that's uh, really on the tail end of Friday night here in the sanctuary, we had a very successful, very enjoyable, well-attended, well-organized event, musical evening, and um, we raised the sum of at least so far uh, £1,200. There may be more to come in. A big thanks to all those who participated, attended, helped in any way. It's been an excellent event and um, well done to everyone involved. Just to race through these, Poetry Circle meets tomorrow at 11.30, Helping Hands Knitting Group on Tuesday at 2 o'clock, Kirk Session uh, meeting on Tuesday evening, Faith and Friendship on Wednesday evening, Bowl and Bap Lunch Thursday, Youth Drop In Thursday afternoon, and Spark Youth Club Friday. Next Sunday, Reverend John Brackenridge taking the service. Um, I'm taking my post Easter Sunday off. Um, and one other announcement, and it's about uh, item eight. This has been the Francis show today, because I'm going to quote from Michael, who said he had no copyright on this quote, but I do like it. We were due to have a, a litter pick organised by ourselves in the village on Friday coming, but we then just recently got wind of, in fact, on Friday, that there is going to be a community litter pick on the Saturday, and we didn't want them to have nothing left to pick up. <laughs> But this is really important. We wanted to avoid a war of the wombles. Okay, so credit to Michael for his quote. Uh, so our own one has been postponed, but uh, don't throw litter in the first place. And secondly, if you want to help, there is a community litter pick on the Saturday. I think those are all the announcements. And boys and girls, you've been patient. I'm coming down to speak to you right now. And the reason I'm a wannabe youth worker is that our young people are away today at a confirmation, one of our young people in another church, and our, some of our young people and leaders have gone to that to support her and just to expose our young people to a slightly different church tradition. Right, boys and girls, stand up, please, because I want to see how tall you are, okay? Do you mind? And if you're going to remain sitting or lying down, that's okay, but we want to just have some idea. How would I go about finding out how tall you are? What would I use? The naked eye? Have a wee guess? What would I use? Measuring tape, that's the second one, but we're going to get on to this. If I did this and held it up against you a few times, it wouldn't be that accurate. I'd be kind of going like this, and it would be, it would be just a guess. You can measure small things with a ruler, and I'm sure in school you use rulers, 6-inch rulers, 12-inch rulers, or 30-centimeter rulers, if we're talking about um, the other way of measuring. But really, as you said quite correctly, I would get the measuring tape out. And if you can stand on that wee bit with your toe... All right, to stand on that with your toe. Let's see if our teamwork works. And Mary Poppins, she would say something like, very talkative, quite naughty, doesn't put away his toys. <laughs> but I make you, oh, just over five foot. So you're growing and you'll probably grow more. And I could do the same for each of it and we could find out how tall you are. Now, anyone like to have a guess how tall or how small the minister is? That's probably a terribly embarrassing question for you to answer. Five foot nine. I think I'm a wee bit more. The last time I looked and measured I was, but that was quite a while ago. I think it's five foot 11. Five foot 10 and three quarters. Or t what is that in centimeters? Because I had to check. <laughs> Any guesses? Doesn't matter if you're wrong. 180. So there you are, you've got a wee measurement, 5 foot 11 or so is about 180. Now I remember, and a memory was sparked when I was visiting somebody a couple of weeks ago. I went into the house and I was standing in the doorway talking to him between the kitchen and the living room and I saw on the white paint at the door, I saw all these wee pencil marks. Nigel and the property committee, I'm sorry for doing this. I'm only pretending. There was a mark here, and here, and here, and here, and here. What would those, what would those marks be about? What would they represent? Each time somebody who's maybe younger is growing up. And I remember my granddad on both sides of the family both did that. 
And myself and my sisters, when we were growing up, you could find, if you look closely, wee pencil marks just on the door frame and white, just in the white paint or the cream paint just beside the door. It was a mark of how we were growing up. If you want to sit down, that's fine. Uh, that's grand, just because I want to just tell you a little story that talks about someone who wasn't that tall. In fact, he was very small. His name begins with Z, or Z as the Americans said it. We're going to sing a song in a wee minute about him. Do you know what his name would have been? Zachariah. Zachariah is a good guess from the Bible. This is Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a tax collector, and that meant he was very unpopular because he took money from people including his own country people. He kept a lot of it to himself. He was selfish and greedy, but he gave a large amount away to the Romans who were in charge of the country. They were the people who were occupying his homeland, and it was resented that they were taking money anyway, resented that they were in charge, but really resented when people like Zac Zacchaeus and others were taking money to give to the enemy and keep some for themselves. He heard that Jesus was coming. He would heard that Jesus was a great man and did all sorts of good things. He was desperate to see him, but there was one problem. He wasn't really tall. He was very small. But he knew the way that Jesus was going to come through Jericho, the, the town he lived. So he ran ahead the same route, got up a sycamore tree, and he looked down. And Jesus was walking along and suddenly stopped, looked at him, called him, and said, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house for tea. Didn't wait for an invitation, he just announced, I'm coming to your house for tea. And Zacchaeus was overjoyed, but the rest of the people were really angry and they resented it because this was a man who'd done a lot of ill, a lot of bad, and they were resenting the fact that Jesus seemed to be favoring him. So he went, and on the way as he was going, they had a talk, a conversation, and Zacchaeus said, knowing that he had been loved and forgiven by Jesus for all the wrong that he'd done, all of that was gone. Zacchaeus responded in the best possible way. He said that he would give back to those whom he'd taken from, and also he would be generous to those whom he'd taken more from than he should. In fact, four times more than the money he'd taken. And the text ends by saying that salvation had come to his house and that Jesus had come to seek and to save those who were or are lost. He changed his life in an instant, and Zacchaeus made the right response. He was grateful, and he was generous, and he changed his life for good. Now, Zacchaeus didn't grow up a bit anymore. He didn't get any taller. He didn't grow you know, a bit like a, a tree or whatever. He didn't grow any taller after the event. He was still the same little small man. But in truth, spiritually, he was no longer a small man, a mean man. He had grown in stature. Because when Jesus comes to change our lives and we accept that change and we start to do things on the basis of that, being generous and kind and all the rest, then we grow up to be the kind of people that God calls us and Jesus allows us to be. So it doesn't really matter what height you are. It's the stature of who you are and who you will become through the love and grace of Jesus Christ that is the really really, really important thing. So thanks for listening, and we're going to sing your song, our song. It's printed on the screens and the sheet. It's a, it's a short song, so we're going to sing it through twice. Zacchaeus was a very little man who became great.
It's good practice to have some other people reading, but my phone calls yesterday did not reach success, and so I am reading the two readings today myself. It would seem very unfair on early Sunday morning to ask someone, uh, so I'm reading the two texts, both from the New Testament, one a gospel and one a letter. The first one is from Matthew chapter 18, and it's reading verses 21 to 35, and it is uh, a way of looking at the petition that we look at in our series on the Lord's Prayer. Found on page 27 of the New Testaments. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked him, Lord, if my brother keeps on sinning against me, how many times do I forgive him? Seven times? No, not seven times, answered Jesus, but 70 times seven, because the kingdom of heaven is like this. Once there was a king who decided to check on his servants' accounts. He had just begun to do so when one of them was brought in who owed him millions of pounds. The servant did not have enough to pay his debt, so the king ordered him to be sold as a slave with his wife and his children and all that he had in order to pay the debts. The servant fell on his knees before the king. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will, re- I will pay you everything. The king felt sorry for him, so he forgave him the debt and let him go. Then the man went out and met one of his fellow servants who owed him a few pounds. He grabbed him and started choking him. Pay back what you owe me, he said. His fellow servant fell down and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he had him thrown into jail until he should pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were very upset and went to the king and told him everything. So he called the servant in. You worthless slave, he said. I forgave you the whole amount you owed me just because you had asked me to. You should have, you should have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you. The king was very angry and he sent the servant to jail to be punished until he should pay back the whole amount. And Jesus concluded, that is how my father in heaven will treat every one of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. We end the text at the end of the chapter. And then going into Paul's writings and 2 Corinthians his second letter to that church in Corinth, and we take up from verse 16 in the fifth chapter. Paul writes, No longer then do we judge anyone by human standards. Even if at one time we judged Christ according to human standards, we no longer do so. When anyone is joined to Christ, he or she is a new being. The old is gone, the new has come. All this is done by God, who through Christ changed us from enemies into his friends and gave us the task of making others his friends also. Our message is that God was making all mankind his friends through Christ. God did not keep an account of their sins, and he has given us the message which tells how he makes them his friends. Here we are then, speaking for Christ, as though God himself were making his appeal through us. We plead on Christ's behalf. Let God change you from enemies into his friends. Christ was without sin, but for our sake, God made him share our sin in order that in union with him, we might share the righteousness of God. Amen. Someone's needed. We sing now uh, hymn number 62 from the hymn books and the screens, Father of Heaven, Whose Love Profound.
I'm not sure if you're keen on watching comedians live or on TV, but there's one from a number of years ago whom I remember. His name's Emo Phillips. He's an American actor and comedian and very bizarre way of delivering his shows. He's a tall guy and he's got an odd appearance and that's part of his shtick, so to speak, but he speaks in a kind of modulated, up and down, falsetto voice. And his voice goes a wee bit like this, up and down and round about, and it's really odd. It leaves an impression. There's one of his jokes that I remember from the past. He said that as a young boy, he was keen to get a bike because all his other friends had bicycles. So it was coming near his birthday, a couple of months away. So he began to pray morning and night that God would give him a bicycle for his birthday. Come the day, ran downstairs with high expectation, excitement and all the rest, and discovered amongst his toys that there was no bike. So he rethought, I know, I'll steal a bike and I'll pray to God to forgive me. <laughs> Creative or what? A bit naughty, but there you go. It's a wee bit in tune with that mindset that, you know, there's a philosopher, a poet, who said it in, in, in kind of poetic terms. He says, yeah, God forgives. God will forgive. Say son métier. That's his job. That's his business. That's what God does. You can do what you want. God will forgive you anyway. When Paul was dialoguing with some of his churches and he was a bit frustrated, he took on board the counter-argument that says that if God's going to forgive anyway, well, we can just let rip and sin whatever we want, do whatever we want. It doesn't care because God's going to forgive us anyway. And Paul, his repost was, do we sin all the more that grace may abound? No, of course not. You can't presume on the forgiveness of God, though you can and should trust it. A wee analogy, imagine we're talking about litter picking. I mean, if someone is going to pick up the litter and there's people who do that as a living, who pick up litter for a living, you can think, well, sure, you know, I've finished with that. I'll just throw it away. No, because someone picks up litter does not mean that you throw it away. You exercise your own bit of responsibility for your life. Say so, metia, that's God's job. Sure, he just forgives anyway. Well, no. We're looking at a series in the Lord's Prayer, and we've been working through it. We had a break for Easter. That was a lengthy break, but every fortnight there's been a study group, and then we followed on what we've done in the study group in the Wednesday we've shared here on a Sunday in church. And we've worked our way now to what is close to the center, the middle part of the Lord's Prayer, and something that is very easy to say, but much harder to do and to exercise. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Easily said, not so easily done. Now a word about words here. When you look at the versions in Matthew's Gospel and the Luke's Gospel, because Luke has got a shorter version of the Lord's Prayer, he condenses it. You have got three words that are different, but they're similar and they overlap and they mean much the same. You can say, forgive us our trespasses. You can say, forgive us our debts. Or you can say, forgive us our sins. And they mean much the same thing, though there's a different word picture in mind each time. They boil down to the same thing, a common root. But there's a word to look out for in that prayer that throws quite a few people off and leads to at least two misunderstandings. And I want to clear these up at the outset because they're common misunderstandings. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Jesus did not mean that God's forgiveness of us is dependent on and follows upon our forgiveness of other people. Our forgiveness is a consequence of God's forgiveness of us. It's not the cause. It's not the beginning. God doesn't hang back and hold back his favor and says, you know what, I'm not going to forgive until you forgive others. That's not the point. God forgives and that's grace. That's who God is. Don't presume upon it, but trust that God has a loving, forgiving nature. But don't presume. Paul elsewhere writes, 
while we were yet sinners, God died, God died for us, the ungodly, for sinners. It's God's grace, his forgiveness in Christ that comes first. And John in his letter spoke about the fact that here is love. Not that we first loved, but that God in Christ first loved us. And gave forgiveness and reconciliation for how we go wrong. What we've done, yes, but more so and deeper, what we have become. The sort of folks that we are. The second misunderstanding is that God's forgiveness of us is not kind of measured and doled out in a kind of due proportion that is kind of close and exact to what we have done. So if we forgive a lot, God forgives us a lot. If we're mean with our forgiveness or it doesn't happen, God doesn't forgive us at all or forgives very little. That's wrong too. Grace, love, all that comes first. God in Christ is the one who gives and forgives. That's prior. And to get it any other way is to get it all the way, all to get the whole thing the wrong way around and upside down. It is God's grace in Christ that forgives and sets in motion that train, that domino effect of forgiveness following on. That quote from Wordsworth, which is a lovely quote, Give all thou canst, high heaven rejects the lore of nicely calculated less or more. You know, if you're that stingy with your favour and your forgiveness and your love, it really isn't love anyway in the first place, is it? Remember Shylock and the Merchant of Venice and his pound of flesh? That's the kind of legalistic exactitude that probably drives God mad and we don't like it when we meet it. And we hope that we're not like that ourselves. Grace is not stingy. God is not mean. God is loving and generous and creative and fulsome. His grace and love is free. It comes first, it's foremost. But it still has certain expectations of us. And that's what we're going to explore briefly in the, the text today. Because I'm looking at forgive us our trespasses from the Lord's Prayer, but it's good to focus on other texts that kind of converge on it and deepen its meaning, make it more clear. So we look at the parable from Matthew's Gospel, and Peter says to Jesus after early exchanges, if someone sins against me, should I forgive them? Mm, Maybe seven times? That seems fairly generous. And Jesus' rebuke is not seven, but 70 times seven. There are translations that say 77, but let's face it, it's way beyond Peter's smaller, meaner calculations. And then he tells the story of the kingdom of God being like this. He says there's a king, and he decides that he's going to kind of account the books. And there's an accounting, and he finds that there's one of his servants that owes him, and Jesus always makes these elaborate points and kind of eggs it up, millions of pounds, an unpayable debt, and the man can't pay it, and he's in danger of being thrown into prison along with his wife and family until the debt is paid. That's how it worked in the ancient world. But he pleads for mercy. Be patient with me. I will repay it. And he finds, lo and behold, the king is graceful and generous, and he, in a sense, just wipes the slate clean. Go free. Forgiven. Grace. And then the forgiven servant, who is ungrateful, so to speak, becomes the unforgiving servant because he finds someone else who owes him a paltry sum, just a few pounds, and he grabs him by the collar, starts to choke him, he demands his payment. The man makes the same plea that he did just a wee while earlier, but this time the guy exacts his kind of retribution, so to speak, and he throws him into prison. Now here's the point, all the other servants recognize what's happened and they are enraged. And so they bring it to the king's attention and you know how the story goes. The king is enraged by what he hears. He rebukes the person who had been forgiven large and would forgive less and has him thrown into prison. And the the ending is kind of left maybe to our imagination. We don't know how it played out. But the point is this. As we are forgiven, so we forgive. 
In fact, I've given a paraphrase from P.T. Forsyth, who shows wonderful insight on this text. He says, if you want to really understand what Jesus means in that line, forgive, that we quote in the Lord's Prayer, it is forgive us as forgiven we forgive. The clue and the key to this petition in the Lord's Prayer is that it is the grace and forgiveness of God in Jesus Christ that works upon us. And the people who pray this are those who already know and experience and accept the forgiveness of God in Christ. It's not that others dare not pray this, but they're only growing into an understanding from the margins and beginning to understand the ways of God and grace. It's a prayer for the disciples. It's a prayer for the church. It's a prayer for us. Forgive us as forgiven we forgive. There's an interesting um, sort of uh, way in which Jesus puts that together. He, he puts these phrases in the Lord's Prayer into what are called couplets. Verses one and two and then another one. So it goes like this. And there are four couplets in the Lord's Prayer. It starts, our Father who art in heaven. That's the first line. And then the couplet, the, the line following that is, hallowed be thy name. That's the first couplet. The second couplet is, thy kingdom come. And then the other line for that, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the second couplet, two phrases. And then the third couplet is, give us this day our daily bread. And the couplet with that is, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. In other words, when we pray for God for daily bread, that's daily bread provision, food for the stomach, food to survive, daily nourishment. But we also twin with that a daily prayer for forgiveness too. That's what you may call heavenly nourishment, the food of forgiveness, the free flow of grace, God's gift, and then our task. And that's how Hebrew poetry works. Jesus is only taking a leaf out of the Old Testament, the book of Psalms. Your word is a light to my path and, your, and a lamp to my feet. It's a couplet, a light to my path and a lamp to my feet. When Jesus teaches how to pray, he uses the, verse of, the versification, the poetry, the parallelism, the couplets that is a regular part of the spiritual diet of the believing Jew. In other words, we are already forgiven and we know that and we accept that. But we are asking for the daily, in a sense, renewing of that forgiveness and grace that we already know and accept. Here's a little text from John's Gospel that helps maybe make the point. And again, it's for Scythe, who's in a sense pointed the way to me and hopefully to us. Remember in the upper room when Jesus is meeting with the disciples and in John's gospel, John 13, there's no, there's no in a sense, um, usual breaking of bread and, and sharing of the cup. The other writers talk about that, but John doesn't so much. But he does emphasize the washing of the disciples' feet by Jesus. And when Jesus goes around like a menial slave or servant and washes Peter's feet, Peter says, don't just wash my feet, wash my entire body. And Jesus says, those who have been bathed and purified completely only need their feet washed, not their whole body. In other words, by analogy, you have been washed and purified and cleaned by the grace of God in Jesus Christ, thoroughly cleaned. That's happened once and for all. And all you need on a daily basis is the grime and dirt and all the mess of the things in your life that have gone wrong for that day, washed away. It's daily washing and renewing of the gift of forgiveness, which has been long since given in the past. Give us, forgive us, on the basis of what has already been given to us in the past. There are four steps or four stages or four parts of the understanding of this part of the Lord's Prayer that are really important to keep in mind. And very conveniently, they all begin with S. 
So hopefully you can remember them, and if not, I will maybe do my best to remind you along the way, now and in the future. Two of them are about what God does, and two of them are about what we do. So here's how it goes in a kind of sequence of steps. There's a kind of chronology almost to how these things work in the whole field of forgiveness. First up, it's God in Christ who is the source, the start, the beginning of the work of reconciliation, of friendship, of making friends and of forgiveness. God is the source. It begins with him in Christ. And it's Christ on the cross that is, in a sense, the center around which all this renewing of relationships begins and starts and, in fact, ends. Christ crystallizes the work of reconciliation, of making peace, of forgiving each other. Jesus, God in Christ in Jesus, is the source of all true forgiveness. Secondly, you talk about what's called the state of forgiveness. And that's where Paul's text comes in. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We live in a redeemed and reconciled world. It's a new creation. It's the beginning of eternal life. We live in a new state of affairs. Grace has dealt with the sin of the world. And Jesus Christ is not just, in a sense, pointing that out. He is the actual means by which we are atoned at one, forgiven, restored, renewed. That's a state. It's already happened. In principle, God in Christ has renewed and forgiven each and all. It's a fact. That's why we call it the good news. It's an announcement. And it doesn't matter so much whether you agree or not or hear it or not. This is the announcement that is given. It is a fact, eternally, but enacted in history, once and for all, in Jesus Christ. That's in bold capitals. God as the source of forgiveness and God in Christ as, in a sense, a state of forgiveness in which we are privileged now to live. Now over to us. And the third step or stage is what you might call the sense of forgiveness. I hear this good news. Now it's up to me and it's up to you and it's up to each to accept this or to reject it. To take it and welcome it or to keep it at arm's length or just to walk away. That sense of forgiveness. I've heard that God in Christ is the source of forgiveness and grace. I now am told that I live in a reconciled world. God was in Christ reconciling the world. Now it's over to us. It's an invitation and it's a challenge. Do you trust this forgiving God? Will you open to door, the door to this grace, this forgiveness, this peace, this prospect of a new and better life, the beginning of eternal life? The invitation and the challenge is given. It's over to me, over to you, over to us. Will I receive it? Will I accept it? Will I make it my own? And the fourth stage and the fourth step, and maybe the clincher for the whole thing, because without it, that kind of virtuous circle of forgiveness and grace, in a sense, gets blocked. Doesn't really work as it might, fully and effectively, as this. It's to move from the sense of forgiveness to the spirit of forgiveness. And that means as I have been forgiven, so I am asked, the responsibility is on me. Indeed, I am expected to begin to exercise that spirit of forgiveness to other people too. As I have been forgiven, as my debt has been cancelled, as my sins are behind me, so I am to go and seek those, or when I meet them, or wherever it is, I am to seek the reconciling of a relationship, the re-establishment of friendship, 
God was in Christ reconciling the world. That's a state. Be reconciled to Christ. That's on us. That's to accept this sense. And then continue the work of reconciliation, of making friends, is how Paul also points it very nicely. And the thing about it is, it's on us. If it's only the sense and we accept it, but we don't actually use it and work with it, if we don't spread forgiveness that has been short upon us, then there's a blockage and there's a pity and maybe even a tragedy. We're somehow getting in the way of the full flowing outreach of the living, loving God in Christ. You're familiar with the phrase, and Jesus uses it several times, if you don't use it, then you lose it. If you don't exercise physically in certain ways and certain abilities that you had in the past, if you don't continue, at some stage you will lose it. And there are certain gifts and talents and things that we do that if we do not continue to exercise them regularly, if not daily, then we begin to lose them. And it's the same with grace, and it's the same with forgiveness. It's the same with reconciliation. The big news is that God in Christ is the source of forgiveness. The next big news is that this means the world is reconciled, forgiven. That's the state. That's in the world in which we live. Then it's up to us to accept that and embrace that, to trust him, and that's the sense. But the sense needs to lead to the spirit and the work and the enactment and the doing of deeds of mercy and forgiveness. What's the point of mercy that's known if mercy isn't shown? Jesus makes it abundantly clear that he has all the resources within him and his spirit to give to you, to give to me, to give to us, to get on with life and make amends when we make a mess, to heal the breach, to mend the the wounds, and to kind of, in a sense, move that further step from a sense of being forgiven to practicing forgiveness with those we meet. Parables make it clear. Paul's letter makes it even more clear. And whether you like the parables or the letters or something else in between, it's abundantly clear that God in Christ is sufficient for all our needs. All our needs. If you don't use it, though, you might just lose it. Let us pray. Living God, whose mercy is as your majesty, indeed whose majesty is defined by your mercy, we answer your grace in prayers of gratitude. In ancient times, your majesty was most evident in the grandeur of creation, a vast theater of glory in which earth and sky, forest and field, ocean depth and primeval wilderness spoke volumes of some supreme creative power. Then to the people of Israel, from Abraham to Esther, from Moses to Mary, your majesty unfolded in words of promise, acts of salvation, repeated calls to trust and obey your sovereign summons. And then finally and fully, your word became flesh, Your son embodied salvation and your call went forth to the most ordinary of people, marked out to be disciples of Jesus Christ through thick and thin. And then most amazing of all, even though their sin was painfully obvious, not least to themselves, Jesus crucified rose from death meeting them again with mercy, not retribution, with peace, not accusation, with a new calling to spread the glad good news of forgiveness, of reconciliation and of healing. Lord God, we pray for your ministry of reconciliation to prevail, 
even or especially in those contexts where differences turn to friction and friction hardens into suspicion and division. May your spirit loosen and unravel the tight knots in which our world is terribly tied. Nation to nation, faction to faction, person to person. Let the grace of Christ, the very basis of peace, the source and centre of forgiveness, challenge us all to honest repentance. The open heart surgery of your hurting yet holy healing. A new creation indeed. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Your offering will be received. Let us pray. O God of life and love and peace, we give you thanks that Jesus Christ is our peace and that his grace is the source of all true love, forgiveness and well-being. As we return our thanks, we pray that we too will be ministers of reconciliation and of forgiveness, difficult though it may be. Take these our gifts, our money, our service and our lives for your continuing work through Jesus Christ, his grace and his peace. Amen. We turn to uh, 367 as our last hymn, our last praise for today. A lovely John Bell and Graham Wall song, We Cannot Measure How You Heal.
the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Thank you.